Good morning and thank you for joining us for this webinar on transformation and market access for women in agriculture. Um, Farmers Weekly is happy to partner with the Western Cape Department of Agriculture to host this event. I'm Danine Rasmus, I'm the editor of Farmers Weekly and I'll be guiding us through um, this, this webinar today. I really hope that through today's discussion, you will be inspired to learn about some of the progress that has been made towards shaping an agriculture sector um, that is an environment where women can feel welcome and empowered. And I also hope that through the discussions that we will have today, that we will be that we will distinguish distinguish between those barriers to entry and access that apply specifically to women. Um, versus the challenges that exist in general and that applies to anyone hoping to establish a career for themselves in the agriculture sector. We've got 90 minutes this morning and we've got a very full program. Um, so we will start with an introductory round during which each of the five panel members will just introduce themselves and speak about what they themselves or their organizations are busy with. And then after that, we will go into a question and answer panel session um, during which I will pose some, some general questions to all of the panel members. But that will also be an opportunity uh, for you as the audience to, uh, to ask any questions that you might have based on those short presentations that the speakers will give or, um, or just responding to some general points that we might have talked about during the discussions. Um, so without wasting further time, um, let's get started with our first speaker today, which is Dr. Mukhale Sebupetza. And he took over this year in April as the, the head of the Western Cape Department of Agriculture. He has extensive public sector management skills and he previously held the post of Chief Director for Farmer Support and Development at the Western Cape Department of Agriculture. He first started working at the department in 2006, and he's been working there for over 20 years. Previously, Dr. Sebupetsa worked at the Gauteng Department of Agriculture, and he's also worked for the National Department of Agriculture. And during his distinguished and long career in the, in the sector, he also lectured at the University of Limpopo for some time. He has played a pivotal role in establishing various policies to the, be to the benefit of farmer development, which means that he will be um, very knowledgeable about some of the challenges that we will address during the discussion today. And according to Dr. Seba Petsa, he used his deep interest in improving the lives of farmers as the backbone for his PhD dissertation um, in which his research focused on the development and extension framework for smallholder farming. Um, good morning, Dr. Seba Petza, if you can join us. A very good morning to you, Danin, and thank you very much for such a warm introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity. Let me start by acknowledging all the women in our country. This is the month of women. We want to commend all the women and uh, salute them for the great work uh, they do in various sectors. But uh, uh, being the head of department, I want to acknowledge also those who are in the agricultural sector and doing a sterling job. Women stand out as pillars for economic uh, growth. Uh, in agriculture and agribusiness sector. And for us, as uh, the Western Cape Department of Agriculture, we believe strongly that investing in women is investing in economic growth, it's investing in jobs, and it's also investing in uh, the issue of uh, food security. There is enough evidence, uh, uh, Denin, that uh, if women were to be given same uh, access to uh, to productive assets um, like their male counterparts, they could actually um, increase their yields by up to. All the good work that 
And despite all the work that uh, women are involved in in agriculture, it is unfortunate that many of them are still confronted uh, by challenges when it comes to uh, access to resources in terms of, in this case, access to land, access to finance, uh, to be able to do uh, what they are required uh, to do. But now, let me bring everyone to the Western Cape Department of Agriculture. What are we doing about uh, these particular issues? Our mission is to unlock uh, the full potential of the agricultural sector to enhance the economy, the ecology, but above all, the social wealth of the people uh, of the Western Cape. Now, talking to the subject that uh, we are discussing here today, the issue of transformation and market access uh, for women in the sector, I must upfront say we are committed uh, to transformation. And I'll talk briefly about the, uh, the some of the programs that are transform transformative in nature uh, to enhance uh, that uh, uh, transformation in the sector. Our minister had identified uh, five uh, key uh, priorities. And these priorities are, in our view, and our effort to, to deepen uh, transformation. One of them is the issue around uh, structured education, uh, training, and research. We believe strongly that uh, we've got to invest in capacity building of uh, women uh, to be able to perform better uh, in the agricultural uh, sector. The second priority that is also important to us is the issue around uh, rural safety. We are concerned about the levels of crime, particularly in the farming areas. We think an attack on any farmer is an attack on the economy, is an attack on food security, it's an attack on jobs. The third priority that uh, we've set ourselves is the priority around market access and uh, the target is within the next five years. We want to grow our exports uh, by, by 5%. The fourth priority, uh, Denin, is the issue around uh, farmer support. Uh, in this department, a third of our budget goes into all the work we do uh, to support uh, uh, farmers. And the last priority, but not the least, is the issue around uh, climate change. Many on this call would appreciate that the Western Cape had suffered the worst drought in 100 years. So we are investing in ways and means that would enable us uh, to be able to farm and ad adhering to what one would call uh, the new normal. But lastly, we are also appreciative of the fact that uh, transformation is not the responsibility of government alone. So what we have done 10 years ago, we entered into partnership arrangements with the commercial agriculture. And I must appreciate those who are on the call from the commercial agriculture who have been working with the department so well. We've entered into memorandum of agreement and to a model that we call the commodity approach. And the main objective of that model really is to ensure that we bring mentorship uh, to, to new farmers, we bring access uh, to markets for new farmers, but also we expose the new farmers, particularly women, into the networks that exist within the commercial industry and thereby deepen uh, this particular uh, transformation. So all these are efforts that we put in place uh, to deepen uh, the transformation uh, in, in the sector. But somebody would ask a question, but what is happening in the department? Charity begins at home. There are a number of uh, uh, skills development program that are deliberately looking for women to support them, our bursaries schemes, our young persons professional program, our, our internship program, 40% of that goes to women and we are deliberate about it. At my top management, 33% of uh, my top management is women. And of course, the goal is to make it uh, up to 50% because we are convinced women are better leaders and we see that in the sector where we support women. So that is our input at this point and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned as one of your five priority points the, the issue of rural safety. Because uh, I think you know, I, I often get the question from some of our readers of whether I would like to to be a farmer myself as, as you know, following on my position from here at Farmers Weekly. And um, I think, you know, in my own experience and also from some of the interviews we've had with, with other women, it's 
one of the main areas of concern for women to enter the farming sector really is the safety aspect because you know and not just as a woman but as anyone living out in a rural area on your own um, it's um, the the risk is just becoming too great. So I'm I'm really happy to hear that that's a, a priority area for your department. Um, but to move on quickly, so I, I wanted to ask you during your more than 20 years of experience in the farming sector, much of this time which you spent in farmer development, um, what have you identified as maybe two or three of the greatest gaps that exists? Um, you know, on the one hand, in, in terms of the requ requisite skills that new farmers need to have, um, but also then on the other hand, in terms of the type of support that government is able to offer new farmers. Thank you, Denin. Um, in the last 20 years, um, what I've observed is that one, farming is a business. Um, it's not a charitable work. And therefore, one thing I've observed is the lack of financial management skills um, um, that, that we're observing. And it's not only limited to women farmers, it's all new farmers. And uh, that's, that's the one thing that we have picked up. The second issue is the ability to market their produce. Uh, because you don't sell and consume everything. You sell, I mean, you, you, you produce uh, consume what you need to consume, but sell to to the outside market. So we've picked up that that is uh, also a gap that uh, that we've picked up over the years. The third issue is also the issue around um, proper records. Farmers are not keeping the sales records and production records because uh, and mm -hmm. unless you do that, somebody said <clears throat> if <clears throat> if you cannot measure you cannot manage. So if, if there are no records as to what you produce, what you sell, it becomes uh, completely <clears throat> impossible to uh, to manage and to determine whether you, you're making progress or not. So at the department, we have put a, a number of programs to, <clears throat> to provide support to women. Um, one that comes to mind is the financial record keeping program, whereupon we, 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 we have appointed accountants and assigned them to, to farmers in the program. Uh, to assist them to be able to uh, to put uh, those records, which also in a way strengthen them when they need to 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 get uh, some money from the banks to be able to invest in the in their in their particular businesses, because that also help them to uh, to build uh, credence and credibility, which also can can actually be used when they need uh, to find uh, support uh, from the banking sector. But also our extension support services is very deliberate about these particular challenges because um, we, we, we believe strongly that our extension programs are needed to be responsive and therefore we target uh, these particular areas to strengthen uh, the women in the sector. Thank you, Denny. Uh, yeah, thanks for that as well. And again, you know, on what you've mentioned about the extension services, because that's also from, from all new farmers, you know, from female farmers, um, male farmers um, that are new to the sector, well, um, often do complain about just in general the the quality of extension services that, that they have access to, and um, yeah, I, I think they often there's often the feeling that the farmers themselves have more knowledge than the extension officers that are supposed to support them. So definitely, you know, a crucial a crucial aspect to focus on. Um, so. Um, I want to move on. I just wanted to check if you, uh, was there still a, present, a, a short presentation that you wanted to make or did you cover all of your introductory remarks already? I've, I've covered all that, Denine, and thank you very much. Okay, then I'm going to move on. Um, so I just want to also apologize for that um, that short technical glitch that we had at the beginning of the, um, the presentation by Dr. Sibyl Petzer, but it looks like we've ironed out all of that now. And um, just before I continue to the next panel member, let me maybe just um, introduce all of the panel members so that the audience knows um, um, what what will be what's coming and what we will cover during the program. Um, so next we will speak to Jackie Goliath, who's the co-owner of Defana Nursery in the Western Cape. And then also with us today, we've got Wendy Peterson. She's the operations manager for the South African Wine Industry Transformation Unit. Um, we've got Amanda Chaya, who's the Head of Agribusiness Investment at Westgrow. She will speak a bit later. And then just before we go into the general panel Q&A session, we will hear from Werner van Dijk, who's the Audit Manager for CESA. 
but now let's get back to the program. As I said, next up, we've got Jackie Goliath with us. Um, Jackie is an award-winning farm man, also the founder and co-owner of, as I said, Defana Nursery, um, which is um, closest, which is um, situated close to Sierras. Um, Jackie grew up in Abbotsdale in the Swartland and says her love of plants was cultivated from an early age by lending a hand in the family garden when she was still just a small girl. She later studied horticulture at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology and she worked at the Agricultural Research Council um, where she also worked in the Fainbos division for the ARC. Um, I've known Jackie for a very long time. I first interviewed her in 2013 um, while I was still based in the Western Cape as a journalist for the Farmers Weekly. And this was after she had just won two, um, one provincial and one national award um, in the um, Department of Agriculture's Female Entrepreneur Competition. Um, Jackie was and she remains one of the most inspirational women um, in agriculture today, I certainly think. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you, Deneen, and um, good morning to all the viewers. Thank you for the introduction. Um, Jackie, very good to see you. So I'm going to get started right away with some questions that I have for you. And so first of all, you know, during the, you've had a very long career in agriculture and the last seven years of that as a farmer yourself, um, from your experience, what barriers do women face in the agriculture sector based on your personal experience? Yes. And, yeah, thank you for um, having me um, sharing my journey in the agricultural sector. Um, and you know what? The main thing um, that is really a problem is the perceptions. The perceptions of when you talk to somebody of a farmer, the perception is, is that a farmer should be a male. And historically, obviously, it was mainly white males that was farmers. Mm -hmm. So the perceptions is the first thing that needs to be overcome, um, especially when it comes to women farmers. You know, if you just look at um, being a farmer, um, um, the problem of accessing land, the problem of accessing finance, especially for black farmers. Mm -hmm. Now, what's that about female farmers that needs to, to stand in that line? So the perceptions really needs to change that um, farmers can also be women. And these days, more black farmers are coming to the forefront. I think there's a lot of black far women farmers out there. I just think we don't know about all of them or we don't know about all of those success stories. And I think if you talk about, and I some experiences that I had is that when I went to agricultural conferences with my business partner, which is a male, people will come up to him and ask him, so what are you planting this year or what are you spraying? And you would say, but I'm not farming. Jackie's the one that's farming. They would really look at you almost like, um, okay. And then they'll turn their attention back to him in asking, okay, so what are you spraying? So the perception out there is that women is more like the, the farmer's support system or must be in the administration or must be, you know, doing some of the HR and so forth. And, and that is not what's happening. So I really would like people to start change their perception of women um, and women farmers in agriculture. You know, um, other barriers obviously is markets. Um, and I must echo um, what the HOD was saying, is like um, access to finance and access to land. That is also a, quite a big problem um, when it comes to to our farmers. Uh, Jackie, just to get back to this this issue of perception, I know that not a lot of time has passed. It's been
normal, but there's more female farmers out there that's coming to the forefront. So people are starting to get used, you know, to see female in, in, in the agricultural sector. So yes, things have changed. But you know what? I normally say if you want to play with the with the, 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 the big guys, you need to play the game. So if you come mm -hmm. into any sector, and I'm just looking at myself in, in the agriculture, you need to play the game. You need to be consistent, you need to be persistent, you need to stick up with the quality, and you need to be knowledgeable about the industry that you're in. I mean, you need to show that you know what you're doing. And I think with that comes a lot of respect then from your peers in the industry. Um, I was lucky or privileged to have won the competitions that you have mentioned. And with that, I got the gap to be exposed. And as you've mentioned, we exposed in the media, magazines, televisions, and so forth. So people started to see me. And I took the gap in the sense of, I want to show them what I can do. And I think I've done it. I've earned some, some respect in the industry. Um, I've shown that I have a passion. And this comes with any business, and especially if there's any female farmers that think they want to continue being in agriculture, you need to be confident in what you do. You need to be passionate in what you do, doing, and you need to know what you're doing about, you know, the industry that, that you're in. So um, be confident in, in who you are and believe in yourself, because if, if you're not if you're not confident, then with any major problem, you're just going to kick the bucket and say, sorry, this is not for me. So, yeah, there's there's quite a few stuff that has changed, but I think it's up to you as a person um, that what you do uh, about it. Yeah. And Jackie, for you personally, so, so in your career in agriculture, and especially now in the last eight or ten years or so, um, what do you think, what about you has changed as, you know, being a female farmer and having to deal with these challenges and really sort of having to to make your own way and to, to build a road where there maybe wasn't one for, for women farmers in the yeah. past. So um, how did you as a person have to change? Yeah, you know what? And you've mentioned that I'm, uh, I'm originally from Abbotsdale, which is a very conservative rural area. And so I am a very conservative person, but this industry had made me strong, strong mm -hmm. in will, strong in mind, and strange enough, physically as well, because you physical, you, you go around and so forth. But the industry has actually um, changed me for the best in the sense of, I wouldn't have taken so much risks if I wasn't in the industry, in the agricultural industry. And I mean, taking risks, is saying that you're putting yourself out there, you know, open to anything that can happen to you. So it made me a very stronger person. Um, it made me much more assertive to stand up for myself. Um, and, you know, agriculture, like they say, is not for sissies. Um, so it has really changed me for the best. Uh, it brought up good communication skills as well. Um, yeah, and actually self-discipline because working with nature is actually the best thing that can be there. And you know, with all the climate change and everything that's happening, you just need to change with the changes. And especially being in a predominantly male industry, you really need to stand up for yourself. So um, this industry has really made me um, much stronger in, in a best, better way, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that when you would get to events organized by the agricultural organization, sort of feeling like the odd one out, um, do you think that's changed now when you when you get to these farmers' conferences and meetings? Um, do you feel welcome? Um, yes, I do. And the reason why I say that is that I feel that I have um, I've shown myself um, people know about me, um, and I have proven myself to the industry that I'm forced to be reckoned with. 
So um, I think, and, and that I think has changed. So our female farmers, we must step up to the plate. And if we're on the plate, we must play it. Um, can you just talk quickly, because uh, um, we are also talking today about market access. Uh, for female farmers, just some of maybe just some practical lessons that you've learned um, during your journey as a farmer on, you know, how do you identify markets and then how do you go about pursuing those markets? Yeah. So, yes, it's very difficult to tap into um, markets that's already there because obviously people want, want to buy um, from people that they know um, and people that they know can continuous um, supply sustainable products and high quality products. So um, once I've set myself in the industry, I've learned to um, to set long term relationships with businesses. And once you build a relationship with people and you show them what you can do, that helps quite a lot. Um, when you do have a market that you access, make sure that it is consistent, that you supply high quality products, because people are not going to buy from you if your products isn't, you know, the best. So that is the type of things that you need to look at. But also build a brand. Um, years ago, we normally went to um, trade shows and then people would would see us there. And as we grew, we started these, the logo, the pot, green pot logo. And five years later, people were asking, but who are you? Are you a new company? And I said, no, we've been here for five years. Have you never seen us? And they said, no, we only notice you now. But it was because they, sh they saw our brand. So go out there and build a brand and stick to your brand, but also connect your brand to quality um, and the sustainable supply of products. And have that um, respect with your clients and your suppliers. So build a relationship with people out there so that you can actually um, yeah, um, sell, sell your brand. Mm. Um, Jackie, just before we move on to the next speaker, and I, uh, we're just speaking about your business. Could you maybe just tell the audience a bit more about your business for those who don't know you? That's just so that they can get an idea of what exactly it is that you do. Yes. So, the Fainted Nursery, uh, we started out on being a wholesale nursery, and that is the propagation and the making of plants um, and selling it in containers. But as we moved on, um, over the years, we obtained a farm that have plants on it. And this is obviously when I started then with the exporting of plants. The Fainer is actually situated just between Powell and Wellington. Um, and we have a premises here where we make and nurse plants. So these days um, in the nursery, we grow agricultural crops where we make fruit trees, we harden off tissue culture plants. So a vast amount of agricultural crops that we grow, we nurse, and then we give it back to the suppliers or we send it out into the commercial agriculture. The Fainer um, obviously belongs to myself and a colleague of mine, and I am the managing director, um, and I run the business on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, and I said it was the last question, but I promise now, now this is going to be the last question before we move on. Because um, I think this will this might be very helpful to some of the people listening. It's just, um, if you can maybe talk about some of the support that you have gotten from the, from the Western Cape Department of Agriculture or the National Department, and how did you go about applying for that? Yes, so obviously the first gap that I got, I mentioned, was the um, female entrepreneur competition that I won. And with that got, came a lot of exposure. And you, you know marketing is very, very expensive. But with that came exposure to trade shows, exposure 
to um, various conferences, trainings, capacity buildings, and all of those. That is all that the Department of Agriculture actually helped us. And I must tell you, not only for me, but for my staff as well. And I normally say the business is not about you as owner. It's about you and your workers or the people that's with you in the business. So the capacity building and the mentoring um, and the help from the extension officers um, that came around also helped us um, quite a lot with, with, with um, expanding the business here. Yeah. Okay, so just to clarify on that point, so for some, for a farmer who's completely new to the industry who needs some support, what should be the first port of call? What's the first phone call that they should make? Well, um, for any person that wants to start, they must really have a passion for what they want to do. Okay, and if you know that is what you want to go for, make sure you have a market. Because, yes, I cannot tell you, tell them to call the Department of Agriculture for soil analysis and for water analysis and for extension services. But if the person haven't sorted out their market and don't know which way they want to go, then, you know, why go to somebody to help them if they don't know which road they're going to take? So make sure that they know they want what they want to do. Um, and basically, also know that it must be run as a business. It's not a charity. If you start the business, you need to have business skills. And yes, that can also, um, I think the HOD has mentioned the capacity building around record keeping and financial statements and other financials. So it is important that people should know that if you start in anything, it must be run as a business. Um, and that for me is very, very important. Thanks, Jackie. I look forward to chatting some more when we have the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Denise. So our next speaker and member of the panel is Amanda Ch is Amanda Tsaya, the Head of Agribusiness Investment at Westgrow. She has over eight years experience in foreign and local investment facilitation and more than 16 years experience in client relationship management, portfolio management, and business development strategies. In her years at Westgrow, Amanda has facilitated over 3 billion rands worth of investments into the Western Cape economy. And in a personal capacity, she's also involved in SMME development in and around her community and she does this to educate entrepreneurs on good governance and to guide them on how to access early stage funding. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Amanda and I'm from Westgrove and uh, I'm excited about today's topic, especially uh, talking about women. Uh, not only in agriculture, but uh, women across all different sectors in terms of our participation and how can we uh, see more women um, running their own businesses and growing their own businesses into global um, empires, if I might say it that way. Um, so I'm just going to uh, quickly do an introduction in terms of uh, who Westgrove is and then later on just take a couple of questions. Um, so, Westgrow is the official tourism, trade and investment agency of the Western Cape region. And uh, we've got six pillars. And, and also just to mention, as you can see on top, is that everything that we do within the agency in terms of the engine that runs this agency is basically based on our research unit. We can't do what we do without fresh data. We can't do what we do without uh, market intelligence. So. So um, our research unit, which is available to the public, um, is, is the engine of what we do in terms of making sure that we get it right as, as the Western Cape Agency. Um, just to touch on a bit of the departments that we have. So we've got the tourism department, which is focused on uh, promoting tourism in the, Western, in the, in the region um, by attracting um, uh, tourism and um, uh, leisure tourists into our economy. Uh, which feeds back into the tourism sector. 
We've got our trade department. So the trade department focuses on helping Western Cape businesses uh, be able to find new markets for their products. And we've got different um, trade managers that are focusing on different parts of the globe. So if you are listening in the audience and you, you're wondering where uh, you could take your product, uh, I would encourage you to get in touch with us and then we can get you in, um, in, uh, in touch with the trade manager and we can see where your product can be competitive in the different countries around the world. I sit within the investment promotion unit and I'll touch on, on that a bit later. Um, but we've got different sectors besides the agriculture which is uh, working quite closely with the CTICC. So here we bid for international events to come to the Western Cape. So our role basically is to make sure that we attract tourism, we attract business leisure tourism, so that we can um, market our province and see if we can get more investments um, in the region. We also got a film um, unit, which also sits under trade, and we've got an air access unit. So the air access unit, um, their efforts is to make sure that we increase the number of flights, that uh, direct flights that come out of the Western Cape region, mainly to promote trade and to increase investments. Uh, from a constitutional, legislative and strategic context, um, many of us, as I think the AJD also mentioned that um, agriculture is seen as one of the key sectors uh, from a national government point of view. Um, the Western Cape government as well, in terms of the Department of Agriculture, also has a mandate um, which they follow from a national point of view. Um, Westgro also has a legislative mandate of tourism, trade and investment. And because of these three points, uh, the department decided in 2009 that because they want to grow this investments into the sector, create jobs and grow the GDP of our sector to invest in the unit at Westgro that will focus on attracting more investment and facilitating investment in the sector. And our key objectives uh, for the next five years uh, up to 2025, we've been tasked uh, basically to contribute to us to the VIP2 um, which is economy and jobs, and our role here, which is which is a um, um, uh, not a heavy job, but I would say uh, one of the the main important jobs that we need to do is to facilitate more investment. So we tasked to in, to to facilitate about 2.9 billion in, in terms of fixed investments coming into the sector and grow the number of jobs um, uh, maximum about one 1,625 jobs into the Western Cape. Um, so this is what we've done uh, as a unit um, in the past five years. Uh, we've uh, facilitated over three billion in investments um, across uh, primary and agro-processing. Uh, we've created uh, over 3,000 jobs um, in the sector. We've published about um, 693 reports, and this sits within our research unit. Um, um, and we've done about 104 of those publications focusing on the food and beverage sector and um, some commodities in agriculture. We've done 25 outward missions. So these missions focus on us as a unit going out there and saying the Western Cape is open for business. Mm -hmm. And um, that's basically, that's a message that would put across um, in the different markets that we focus on. And um, we've, we've attracted about 65 business delegations. So when I mean business delegations, this is countries that we've gone to, we've marketed the province, and uh, at the back of that, those engagements, we've had companies coming down to look at the landscape of our, of our sector. So in the next five years, as I mentioned, that's the goal that we have, 2.9 billion investments. So um, in terms of our activities, what we do um, as a unit on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, so if, if I if I touch on the first one, so we work with a lot of international investors that are looking at South Africa, mainly the Western Cape, um, to see what in government grants or grants that are available in order for them to land their greenfield investments in the province. We also work with local companies who are wanting to tap into the DTI incentive or other incentives that are available, and we help them navigate through those applications and 
advise them in terms of what's available. Um, we also facilitate access to finance. Um, so we, during the when we had the lockdown, um, uh, uh, during the time uh, within the unit, we worked intensively with businesses that were having challenges and they were looking for funding, especially uh, funding in terms of helping them to get up, get them out of the woods. Uh, we interacted with over 4,000 companies at the time, trying to see where we can plug them in in order for them to access finance. So most of the time, this is the what keeps us busy because we don't only go to one funding agency. We've, we've got a, a couple of stakeholders from a funding point of view that we work with, local and internationally. And what we do is to try and see if we can raise funding for the businesses on the ground. Uh, we also do uh, professional referral services. Um, we also get quite a lot involved um, with red tape challenges. So uh, our main aim is to see how can we unlock um, uh, how can we unlock whatever challenges that businesses are having on the ground in order for them to operate. And um, this is one of the other activities that we get busy with quite a lot. Uh, we also have a good uh, partnership with Invest SA uh, from an ease of doing business point of view. Um, and we do strategic matchmaking, um, and we also do sector research and some intergovernmental linkages. Um, on the on the top right hand of your screen, you would see that we've got uh, a flower there that shows that the the relationships that we have as an agency and the relationships that we've built over the years as a unit uh, with government, with professional service providers, uh, with universities, and with uh, local and international businesses. Uh, I've just put up a snapshot in terms of the women that we've worked with and uh, uh, beautiful ladies. And I think what was common here in, in, in terms of doing my interacting with them and looking at some bit of research in terms of where they started. Uh, most of these companies, uh, some of you might agree that they, they actually started started from their own kitchen and 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 that's what the experience we've had in terms of the businesses that came to us they started very small they started in their own kitchen but um, over the years they've worked very hard to grow their businesses so some of the businesses that you see on the screen um, are doing quite well they've got nice turnovers in terms of the businesses and some of them at the stage are looking to expand and that's what we're trying to help them with um, at this current stage um, from an export point of view, um, just to touch on a little bit there, we do have an export development program um, that is run by our trade team. Um, this is to help, help um, businesses that are not exporting but would like to identify new markets or to tap into new markets for their products. And these are some of the ladies that went to Uganda uh, with our African trade manager and they've put some testimonials in terms of how it was easy for them to to sign up some deals or to to find clients for the products. So there is um, a lot of help from our trade team if you are interested in, in seeing if where you can export your products or to get into the program which is available uh, at no fee at all. Um, as I said, if you want to, if you want to enroll, um, I'm going to leave my details tell us at the end and you can get um, in touch with me, then I can connect you to our trade team. And that is me and that is what we do. And I hope I've covered uh, everything that you wanted to, to cover. Thank you. Amanda, thank you very much for that. Um, so yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, so, one of the questions that I do have for you is, um, is there sufficient interest shown from women in the investment space? When you, I mean, when you are looking to invest in women, do you struggle to find people or is, it, or is there a lot of interest? Um, in terms of the women that do approach us, it's not at the same level as our male counterparts. Um, we find that the number is quite low um, and most of them are, have been operating uh, for a number of years. However, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense that when we do, even if they do come to us and wanting to expand their 
their businesses, but there's this sort of like fear of um, having to take too much risk from a debt point of view. Um, even if we do start the engagements and we say, great, you know, we can take this business from where it is and we can grow it to um, this big facility, um, you find that throughout those engagements, there's a bit of uh, reluctance to whether it's the it's it's the borrowing that's the that's the fear, um, but we we find that they would rather at the end of the day keep where they are and keep it small uh, and not really take that um, that risk of having to grow into a bigger facility. So so that's that's been my experience in 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 in, in terms of the business that we've engaged with. That they rather keep it. Um, in 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 their arms rich and not go and not grow that fast. Whereas from a male point of view, um, the male counterparts that come here, if if they're looking for 50 million, they're not scared to take a 50 million debt and run with the business and grow that business to a large empire. So, yeah. So I I would say it's a very small number. That's so interesting that you mentioned the, that women tend to be more risk averse because I think Jackie also mentioned that that was one of the lessons that she had to learn in business was was how to um, how to cultivate a, a a bigger appetite for risk. And then just the next question before we move on to the next speaker. So, from if you look from the investment perspective, how important is female representation and participation within a business? Um, for prospective investors? I think for investors, I mean, uh, I, I, I made a couple of uh, engagements before today and I was trying to get a feel of, you know, do international investors have on the top of agenda, uh, does it matter for them if it's a male or a female run businesses? Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily. I think what investors or funders or financiers uh, look at is the business profitability and the scalability of the business. Um, if you've got a good business um, that is profitable or is got an opportunity to scale up, um, and, and obviously looking at the director, the person that's driving that business, um, it doesn't really limit or discourage investment coming into into the sector. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that um, it's it's one of the key drivers of um, of funders or investors looking at setting up or expanding or investing in the Western Cape. It's mainly around the type of business and the profitability and the scale. Um, if you're able to scale up in terms of your in terms of your operations. Mm. Amanda, thank you. Thank you for those interesting insights. So, um, yeah, you, I look forward to when you will join us in a bit when we have the general discussion. Um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, Wendy Peterson, who stands at the helm of the operations for the South African Wine Industry Transformation Unit, NPC. Um, so since joining the organization in, Feb in February 2019, Wendy has been instrumental in ensuring that black owned enterprises and farms receive the relevant mentoring support, funding, marketing, promotional and technical support that ensure that their businesses are sustainable. Wendy holds more than 27 years of experience in the South African wine industry and she has a wealth of expertise on various levels of the wine value chain. Her passion for the wine industry is deeply rooted in the appreciation, commitment and dedication that she has for each person's role across the wine value chain. Welcome, Wendy. I'm really happy that you can join us today. Thank you so much, Celine, and thank you to all the, um, the to participants and um, listeners. Um, firstly, I would just like to say a warm, um, heartly uh, celebration to the women in the industry. I think you form the backbone of our um, agriculture industry, and um, in celebrating you this month, it's very special to us. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so I know you have prepared a short presentation, so I'm going to allow you to do that, and then we'll do a quick question or two. Um, before we move on to our last speaker, so over to you. Thank you. 
So the SA1 Industry Transformation Unit um, has been established in October 2016. And um, the main mandate or the, the key focus areas for our unit is very simple and easy. We do transformation. We do, we generate and promote access, uh, promote um, equitable access of black people in the entire wine value chain. And when I talk about black people, I'm referring to black people in the sense of the constitution. Then we also strengthen and we want to accelerate the development of uh, um, the operational and function, uh, financial capacity of wine farms, but also black businesses um, that is specifically owned by black people in the entire value chain. We also want to increase the representation of black people and with a specific focus of black women and youth in management positions, um, in wine cellar, wine business, and also industry organizations that has been predominantly white male in the past and very recently, after 1994, moving to white females. So we want to change that narrative. We also want to promote um, ethical practices amongst our farmers and um, within a community of stakeholders um, where farm workers and the farm worker community is central to these programs. We also want to promote and be involved in the upliftment of our people and the empowerment of our workers and communities. We want to promote socially responsible consumption of alcohol, of the wine. We know that we're in an industry that has got very um, a lot of harm, and we saw this now during COVID-19 as well. So our focus is that on responsible consumption of alcohol, being educated about alcohol, celebrating alcohol instead of overconsuming alcohol. We also want to assist in the facilitation of an inclusive social compact. Um, and I'll go into detail about what the social compact is, but it's basically a, an agreement between government, labor and industry in all in to look at the social development aspects and economic development aspects of our industry. So we basically receive levy funding, statutory levy funding, and we are the principals of that funding. So the funding is then allocated towards activities and uh, support programs, um, specifically for black people in the wine industry. In um, your yeah, my budget is not big, but we, we use it very wisely. So 60% of my budget goes to enterprise development, 18% goes to skills development and training, 17% 17 on management control, and then we really want to do ownership. And there's a wine industry strategic um, uh, study done or, uh, or um, target set where we need to be at 20% of black land ownership um, in 2025. So that is very a very hectic um, target to reach. Just to give you an idea, in 2015, we were standing on 1.5%. So it's a massive jump that we need, still need to do. Then 5% goes to social development initiatives, um, and that is specifically towards farm worker and farm worker con community um, programs, where we want to look at how can we better their livelihoods and um, support and assist them. So as you can, my total budget per year is about 22 million rand. Um, so it's not a lot of money, and we have to, the need is so big. So what I do is we can collaborate with um, industry organizations, but also agricultural and um, organizations and government to ensure that we leverage funding. So I normally say I give one rand, you give two rand, and together we will make 10 rand. Um, so it's about partnerships. It's about collaboration. It's about assisting where the need is in order to push the agenda for transformation. Then um, I'm just going to very run briefly through the programs that we support. Um, so on the black owned uh, enterprise support or the black owned business support, we provide grant funding to get um, and specifically marketing grant funding, marketing and promotion to ensure that the businesses do have enough capital, you know, to to do market activities for the products um, and to get the products into market and uh, to promote the products. Then additional to that, we also do um, market access support where we will take, um, we will look at a yearly program and see which countries we want to do um, exhibitions in, shows in. And then the qualifying companies will then have an additional support where we take them. We take 10 or 13 companies to in a market. We do all the activities, um, 
with the idea that they get to interact directly with the consumer, they get to interact with buyers, retailers, and importers, informing that relationships. And what we've also found with the market access programs, um, and I've talked specifically with China and some of the um, other key markets, is that the importers and buyers want to see you the year after year. Um, so the question always remains, but how many years do we support a brand in going? And I normally say that if you are there for three years, it shows that your company is reputable, your company is credible, and that they feel sound, you know, in doing business with your company. Then we also provide black-owned uh, brand mentorship support programs. Um, we do understand that for business entering the market, you need to have a solid business plan. The business plan will is your roadmap. It tells any investor or company that wants to provide funding for you, where you're going, where you want to be, what what is your current status, and where what is the journey look like for them to show interest in your company. Then in South Africa, if you need to trade legally, you need to have a legal license. So we ensure that we help and assist brands or enterprises getting the legal license. We also assist with the trademark registrations where we protect your trademark. We protect your IP um, of your brand and what you've built up so that you don't have a brand in whichever country and after five years to realize that there is a another brand being established and then you lose all your investment and your hard work. So we protect your trademark for you to ensure that when you trade that you're protected. Then um, I think HOD mentioned the financial assistance. Um, it is a big uh, problem for our both the enterprises and also the farms. Um, we are solid financials and, and I'm talking about financial accounting and bookkeeping but also on the financial planning and strategic financial planning um, where you determine, you know, what do I need to have or do in order to be profitable after so many years? So what, did, what do I need to plow in to get out? So we are in a position where we provide financial mentorship assistance and uh, get in a person that will walk the journey with you. Um, and sometimes the uh, the entrepreneur, the business owner, is also the financial person, is also the marketer, is also the PR person. And um, if you at least know that your financials in order, then you can sleep a rest uh, a, a good at night. Then on the farm support, we do provide also grant funding. Um, what we do there is that we establish with the farmers, we can um, dedicate an allocated amount that can go to the planting of vineyards. We also assist them with um, acquiring of assets. Um, and so, so on the farm support, it's all dependent on what that farmer or, or that scheme needs in order for them to get from level A to level B. So we will have a one-to-one -one conversation with a farm owner to establish their specific needs. Then currently, the transformation unit has also signed a service level agreement with Vinpro and also with the Department of Land Reform and Rural Development. Um, and what we do there is that we provide technical and viticultural support. Um, we know Vinpro is very strong on technical viticulture and onology. Um, so we have partnered with them in the sense where if our brands or our farms need um, farm support, then, then it's as easily available as uh, picking up the telephone. We want that 24-hour assistance. We want that mentor in the farm that works with our farm workers. So we've basically bought a ticket into having that facility that is normally at a very high price. Then we also provide provide um, mentorship uh, support programs and um, where we assist with corporate governance, financial assistance. A lot of the farms... Um, has also established themselves as a farm worker scheme where farm workers um, make up more than 51% of the shareholding agreement with a white farmer. So the question always comes of how are our farm workers protected? So what we do is that we get in somebody to assist these farm workers to understand what is their role according to that shareholding partnership agreement and to ensure also that they understand the financials. So when they change from being a farm worker into this boardroom space, that they are equipped with knowledge, self-esteem, that they know what questions to ask, that they know what's going on in their financial statements, um, because we want to empower them. We want them to be um, 
uh, empowered body on that um, uh, shareholder agreement. Then the focus for 2020, um, COVID-19 has, the pandemic has made us revisiting our program. But for me, the, on the transformation space, there needs to be at this stage key, I call it key game changes that will take transformation from this level where we can actually say that we will be where we want to be in 2025. So um, we need to establish a brand, brand home for Black-owned brands. The reason being that whenever we go to shows and events and the importer is standing in uh, front of you and ask you, but I'm coming to South Africa, where's your wine farm? Then most of the brands say that, well, I actually don't have a, a wine farm. Um, and then take them to the white commercial partners farm. And that leaves a sense of, but okay, how credible are you now really? What we found is that if we've got a brand home, the brands will have a sense of belonging. They will have a space that they feel is their own, where they can live the culture, where they can live the, you know, the dynamics of what a diverse South Africa looks like. Um, and in all aspects of food, culture, music, um, the ethos of a diversified South Africa. So it's really important for us to get that brand home established. Then COVID-19 has also um, made us realize how important e-commerce is. Um, we couldn't trade for a long period now um, during COVID-19. And e-commerce forms that backbone where the consumer can actually buy directly from the brand owner. So that is also key for us. Then mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. We need to establish mentorship programs and, and be head on with mentorship uh, support programs for black owned brands and farms. Then we will still do market access um, uh, uh, initiatives when we are, can travel again. The local market is still key for us. We've also established that the US market, especially with a Black Lives Matter campaign and movement, that the US market is ready for to do business with black people. So we need to get our brands out there. We had a very successful tasting last Saturday. And it just shows that the, um, the American consumer is very much interested in our stories, in our culture, in our heritage. And we need to um, bring that um, to South Africa and also take that back to America. The Scandinavian market has always been a key market for us, so we'll continue. And then Africa uh, also plays a vitally important market for the black owned brands. Thanks for that, Thanks Wendy. For that, Wendy. Um, yes. some, some, yes. interesting, some interesting yes. comments that you made about the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns on the industry. Um, so I, I think the last um, that I saw, the, the industry estimates that because of the ban on the two subsequent ban on bans on trade, first for export and local and then just local, might have cost the industry about 7 billion rand. Is that going to have a direct financial impact on on the work that you do? I will most definitely. It will almost definitely have more in the sense of farm workers um, losing jobs and farm workers being affected. I had an interview the other day, so I said, you know what, the the challenges that the wine industry is facing currently has always been the challenges that the black-owned brands have been facing, and it actually made them very resilient. Um, so with COVID-19, yes, sales were, sales were down, but our brands, the black-owned brands, are so resilient already. So, And what the, the Transformation Unit has also done is that we've supported a few companies. We couldn't support everybody, um, but we supported a few companies just to sustain themselves and um, through COVID-19. So we've supported 15 companies for six months now with a monthly cash relief in order for them to keep their businesses afloat. Then when it comes to the farm workers, um, and this is for me the sad reality that poverty of our farm workers is already at a very low Um so the, the, the needs and the social development was um, elevated during COVID-19 because we understood exactly what was right in front of us. And sometimes we don't see what's in front of us. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that COVID-19 has elevated this for the industry to react to the social development needs of our communities. Uh, just a last question, Wendy. Um, so. 
I mean, I'm sure that the challenges that a female farm worker in the wine industry faces is vastly different from the challenges that a female winemaker or owner of a wine farm, for example, faces. So, um, so at Savit, how do you how do you balance those um, those different needs that that the women might have on the different levels? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. It's a very important question. So our farm worker women specifically struggle with um, a lot of challenges, and it's in some cases it's very similar, but also different to the say a owner of a company's challenges. Yeah. So the challenges for farm workers, it's basically the basic challenges, skills development and learning. They've been trained in a certain, to do a certain job. Now suddenly their dynamics change and just keeping them up, upskilled, I call it, keep, keeping them relevant and upskilled. Um, we know that the agricultural space is getting more technology, technologically advanced. So in order to in, ensure that there are tools for the right equipment to handle the um, fourth industrial um, revolution, that they are geared to, to handle that and that we, we do support them in that. Um, then also wages. Um, I mean, wages is a big thing. We still have that females are earning less than men. Um, and then although the job is... Um, are very similar. There is still um, um, wage discrepancies. We need to get that right. Then with a female or with a woman comes the social, the community problems as well, or the community social challenges, which relates to um, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, gender violence, um, teenage pregnancies. And those are challenges follows her, and we need to address the bigger community, um, community challenges as well. Then social protection uh, with regards to a provident fund, um, health care facilities, um, retrenchment packages. Those are basic needs, security needs that we also need to look at in the agricultural space. Um, health care is a big thing. Um, where in the rural communities, the health care and clinic facilities is so far from our farms. How do we get the health care clinics to the farm or vice versa? Um, and I think that's where in the space where we can make a difference. On the black on enterprise side, there's a lot of challenges. I don't know even know where to begin. But one of the big things is um, we need land, land ownership. We need to have um, that the brands actually have property to work from. Um, most of our brands, they, uh, they have um, positioned this, uh, themselves further down the value chain. So they've got a marketing, they're basically a marketing company, but now you need to work your back way back into the primary production space where you, the wine that's in the bottle, you own the vineyard, you own the resources. Um, and that will uh, ensure that our brands get um, uh, competitive when it comes to pricing models. At the moment, our brands are price takers. Um, and we need to change that narrative because we can never be competitive in a market that's so price driven if we don't get that right. Um, infrastructure is also a very important thing, um, space for bottling, um, agro -pro processing, um, and then also distribution channels. Distribution channels in South Africa is currently geared to, to facilitate the larger organizations. Our companies are small. We need distribution and logistics um, that can handle our smaller SME companies, you know, to get the product on shelf, to get the uh, product to the consumer. Um, so this is just a few challenges. Um, and I, as I said, there's a list of I can go on the entire day. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so, um, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll speak to you again in just a bit. Um, we've got our last um, speaker today and last member of the panel up next. Um, Werner van Dijk, and he, he's from the Sustainability Initiative South Africa. Um, he joined the team in 2018 as an ethical and labor law specialist, uh, where he became responsible for all audit oversight functionalities to ensure continuous improvement within the auditing process. And then in 2019, he was formally appointed as CESA's audit manager. Um, with a background in law and psychology, Wagner's edu education formally assessed his skills, whilst his upbringing on his family farm in the Northern Cape enforced his passion for the agriculture industry. Um, Wagner is going to speak today specifically about uh, a recent report that CESA did. It's a 
exploratory study on women and gender equality in South African agricultural careers. Welcome, Werner. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Deneen. Thank you so much. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. A special thank you to the Western Cape Department of Agriculture and Farmers Weekly for initiating a wonderful webinar um, and providing a platform for a very important topic and discussion. The Sustainability Initiative of South Africa, better known as CESA, provides market access through a world-class digital platform and reports on fair labor practices and environmental stewardship by means of third-party ethical and environmental audits. So as part of ensuring sustainable and ethical practices, uh, CESA, in support from the Western Cape Department of Agriculture, launched a research project at the start of 2020 to allow global markets and local stakeholders a glimpse into how women are represented within the South African agricultural sector. The research outlined the extent to which gender roles have changed in recent years and identified areas where improvements can be made to eliminate possible barriers that might still exist. So the primary objective of this study was to determine how many women are employed in the industry and how they are represented. So when we look at the barriers faced by women in agriculture, uh, the research identified perception as a major barrier. Deneen, I'm just struggling to get the slideshow to move on my side. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't think there's anything that I can do from my side, but if you, I think, you know, if you can, if you can maybe just continue without the slideshow and just talk about the report okay. then. Oh, there we go. There, it's fine. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So the research identified perception as a major barrier, and, and this will include a wide range of aspects such as culture or patriarchal and traditional values influencing gender roles. So women who are expected to attend to household tasks are not always encouraged to take up leadership roles and aspects such as prejudice, sexism and discrimination from both men and women are generated by this idea and the perception that agriculture is a man's job. And then a high percentage of respondents reported that pregnant women do not necessarily influence productivity. However, mothers or women tasked with childcare are not always able to work the same number of hours than men. But furthermore, they are deemed less dependable when they have to deal with sick children or getting them to and from school, for example. So this view is definitely seen as a barrier for most women um, as their role is now perceived as being different from men. Seeing that agriculture is perceived as a man's world, in many scenarios, women do not apply for management of higher positions in the business. And also women struggle to break through these barriers um, and they find that they have constant they constantly need to prove themselves worthy of their position another barrier is the physical strength of women um, and linked to this is the operation of things like heavy machinery and the hard labor involved with low skilled work and that being said development of new technologies might make physical strength less of a barrier in the future and then of course Emotional capacity is very often forgotten or misconceived as a weakness instead of a strength. Respondents highlighted two aspects with regards to education and training as a barrier. First, the low level of diversity in women's skill set and training makes it difficult to adapt or to move between different opportunities within the business. And secondly, women find it difficult to gain work experience at any level. And it is through hard work that these skills, passion and motivation are generated to break through these barriers for women in agriculture. And additionally, it was found that not enough women are studying agriculture at a tertiary level um, because of the perception that these facilities are generally geared towards men. The social understanding of gender roles is greatly influenced by media and advertising. And as such, media can be a barrier to gender equality, but it can also be used to promote it on a large scale. Mm -hmm. Other barriers can include the safety and vulnerability to attack of women on farms, whether it be physical, verbal or emotional. And of course, the major barrier of sexual harassment. 
So the research also looked at the responsibility of men towards ensuring gender equality within agriculture. And men have a crucial role to play as agents of change. And it is important that men acknowledge that women are discriminated against in all industries and in various roles. And in order to drive systemic change, men should openly challenge the status quo and they should accept their role as change agents. Men should lead by example and use an already established voice to drive change alongside their female equals. It was identified that acknowledgement in the workplace should be encouraged. It is often that women feel that they are just not good enough and men can assist by educating and challenging these perceptions and motivating women that they are in fact worth it in the workplace. It might be difficult for men to accept women in different roles and it might be intimidating for them and men need to adapt to their role and now in turn women can assist men in this regard. Men must make the workplace safe and an equal opportunity environment where inputs from women are encouraged and appreciated. Breaking down barriers will mean that male stereotypes should be challenged and dissolved by men themselves. Remember that culture and background plays a large role in the reasoning behind behavior for women. And men need to acknowledge these cultural aspects and they need to be aware of their perception regarding it. It is also important that men don't feel ostracized for their role in driving change, but rather feel that they are useful in assisting where they already have a voice. When we look at what organizational assistance can be offered, um, education and training is definitely an important um, um, assistance that can be offered, where um, they can raise awareness and they can offer um, developing bursary programs for tertiary education and skills development. They can improve the accessibility and diversity of training programs focused specifically on women. And these can include uh, practical training like pruning, or tractor and forklift operations, or other skills such as administrative, leadership, financial or business skills. Um, the training courses can be developed that focus specifically on personal development, such as family management, life skills, or how to deal with discrimination and looking after your mental well-being. Raising awareness is one of the most important contributions organizations can make towards women dignity. And this can include raising awareness on how to deal with cultural differences and traditional values that may continue to cause gaps in gender equality, raising awareness of training and employment opportunities for women, and I think more specifically highlighting the success stories of women and their accomplishments in agriculture expose women to a variety of aspects and levels within the industry. Host road shows and farm worker competitions that emphasize the women's role and their con contributions. Other contributions can include creating forums to discuss gender equity in the industry as well as safe channels through which to report very important aspects such as discrimination or unfair labor practices. And it's also important that regular interviews are conducted with women on all levels to gain a better understanding of what those needs are. And just to end off, I would like to say that women has an important role to play in the future of agriculture worldwide. And although the role of women in agriculture enjoys more recognition um, in comparison to a few years ago, much more can be done to support women in the industry. And it is ultimately not only about the women, but about the wider industry and the society working together as one. Thank you very much for that, Vano. So um, we've got about 10 minutes left that I just want to do a bit of a general discussion. So if I can please ask all the panel members um, to just join us again and switch on your, your cameras and your microphones. Uh, I'm going to jump right in with um, with the first question, and so uh, this is something that I've struggled with, you know, to understand, you know, when we offer opportunities and programs and all of the competitions that we often offer for women, how do we prevent crossing the line from really empowering women 
um, going into a territory where where women feel patronized as if um, you know you're, you're you are good enough farmer for a woman but you know not yet strong enough to to um, to compete with the men in the industry and maybe Jackie if you can comment on that and um, being on the receiving side of that um, these programs what what do they need to target to really empower you um, I think it's 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 important that we have good leaders and mentors, mentors I think. Um, because if we have good leaders in females and mentors as well, that will definitely also guide, um, I mean, the upcoming um, farmers, female farmers, I mean, to lead them there. Okay. And Amanda, if you can maybe also weigh in on this, you know, and when you approach women, how, how do you think, how do you make sure that you are being empowering instead of patronizing? Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I think I, ideally when, when you, when you, when a client comes to our offices, we, uh, we don't see them as male and female, you know, you, you, we see a business person, we see an investor. Um, and I think on, on our side, even when we do the introductions to the different funders, whether it's international or local, uh, there's no element of us pre pre uh, presenting the initial investments as a, as a, you know, be sensitive, this is a woman type of investment. Not at all. So for us, every every business that we look at um, is equal. Um, there's no differentiator in terms of it's a male or female. And uh, we give the same um, energy and the same um, uh, protection and the same um, uh, confidence to that business as we would give to any other male run business. So I think for me, that's the the way that I could try and answer that question. But uh, we promoted in the same breath and um, in the same way as we would promote any other business that comes to us. And Wendy, I want to come with you with the next question. So you listed a lot of the challenges that um, the farmers and the uh, everybody who works in the wine industry that you work with face. If we look at these challenges um, that new entrants, you know, both in farming and in agribusiness face, which of them are unique to women and which of them are sort of just more general challenges that any new entrant would, would face? Thank you, Lene. Um, I think for me, it's um, some of the challenges, especially on the farm local woman side, where they are in part of the scheme, there's still a lot of intimidation, victimization, you know, taking place. And we should not um, so let's be let's speak about the elephant in the room. Um so I think we have to is to basically assist these farm local women to to gain self-confidence when we walk into a room. Sorry, is my mic a little bit um so we're struggling to hear you a bit. Is that better? Yes, I think that's better. Okay. So, so basically it comes from a little bit of self-confidence, I think. Um, so if we try to, uh, to carry that self-confidence with who the person is, then on the black on brand side, the enterprise side, we've got very strong women um, in that um um, in that space, um, who can firmly stand their ground. But I think still, you know, when we go into price negotiations or agreements or contracts with the producers, um, that they, they still feel sound enough to get into a negotiating space where they feel comfortable and stand on their, on their own solid ground. Thanks for that, Wendy. Um, so I just quickly want to come to some of the questions that we, we received from the audience. And I'm going to come to you first, Dr. Sebupetza. And that was around um, funding specifically for women who want to do research in the agricultural space. Um, is there any programs run by the department or organizations that you know of that specifically address research funding for women? 
thank, thank you very much, um, Denin. I I would want to refer that um, question to uh, my colleague at the department that is dealing with research, uh, Dr. Ilse Troutman, um, because I also believe um, in the notion that uh, before you embark on any research, there's also a need to appreciate what the research may have been done in that particular space. Um, and um, also the fact that we collaborate with academic institutions around that area. Um, and therefore, I think uh, my contact can be provided to this to this person and uh, we could link them up uh, with the colleagues that are responsible uh, for research in the department. Thanks, yes, we'll make sure that you, um, that he can, that he's able to get in contact with you. And then a question for you, Vanna, from one of the audience members. So let me just open this up. So they wanted to know um, what the size of the research population was that you um, that you polled for the paper. And then also if there was any variance in the results based on factors like income level and race. Uh, thanks, Deneen. So the research was two parts. There was a, a quantitative uh, research and there was also a qualitative part to it. Um, in terms of gathering quantitative data, um, it was countrywide, so it included all provinces in South Africa. Um, as part of re uh, CESA's contribution, we did send out a research survey to CESA members, but it was also distributed wider within the industry. So, um, unfortunately, the, the gathering of data is not the easiest thing, in, in specifically within the agricultural sector. Um, but the research population included the entirety of South African agricultural industries. Um, the research did not specifically make any mention of any variances in terms of income or race. However, um, they're most welcome to go and read it for themselves um, and also watch the documentary that is available um, on the CESA website. Um, and if they have any questions, they can just let us know and we can answer it for them. Thanks, Vanna. So um, we've pretty much run out of time. So I just want to pose a last question that I that I want all of the members of the panel to respond to um, before I close off. And that is, if you believe there are any unique skills and capabilities that women bring to the agricultural sector. And I'll start here with you, Jackie, and then move on to Amanda from there. Jackie, you just need to switch on your microphone again, please. There you go. Sorry. Skill that I definitely feel is that um, compassionate, being a compassionate individual brings a lot to any industry. And I mean, being in the agriculture and a very difficult industry, um, it's, it's very, very hard. It's very risky, but I mean, working also with the workers, it's a very, it's tough out there. And I think our females bring the compassionate side that uh, does, a, 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 it means a lot. Yeah. Thanks. And then Amanda, from your side, the response to that. And you must also please turn on your microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I think just on top of my head, obviously it's just, that was a quick one, but I would say competition, and uh, I think that's what we bring. And and we would really love to see a, a lot of women uh, getting into the space. Uh, for instance, the youth getting into the space. I think um, there isn't much youth-led um, um, companies out there, and uh, this is something that I think we we should focus on and drive from a province point of view. Um, agri tech as well. Um, we see a lot of males on that space and there's not enough women getting into that space. So I would say, um, interestingly enough, it would be competition. Okay. Thanks. And then Dr. Seba Petsa, so with your more than two decades experience having worked with many men and women in the industry, um, what have you experienced as some of the unique skills and capabilities that women bring to the farming sector? Thank you very much. Women um, are better at building relationships. And um, and uh, if you are in business of agriculture, you've got to 
always look for ways to build relationships with um, one your neighbors neighbor farmers but also colleagues in the market space so women are actually better at that but uh, women also have a lot of common sense um they they excel in common sense and uh, they are quite resilient um look at Jackie 12 years later she's still in the same business um you if you count men that started at the same time with Jackie you probably find fewer men uh, but the likes of Jackie are still going on 12 years later in the business resilience common sense and better at building relationships Warner and from your side I will have to agree I think resilience um and and dedication and just a general um dedication to to working hard and dismantling these perceptions that are out there. And when yeah I'm going to close off with you also with more than two decades experience and having worked with a lot of women in the industry and being one yourself um do you believe this unique skills that women bring to the agricultural sector that it really helps the sector to grow and thrive. Um yes I definitely think so Deline you know what women have got the natural ability to be natural leaders. Every day we are leaders in our household. It comes so naturally that we forget about our lead- leadership capability. Um our resilience you know we fight for our children we fight for everything we've got and we fight with everything we've got. Um that resilience that tenacity that's what we need in agriculture. and most important it also is that women got the capability of mentoring and coaching paying it forward we normally say paying it forward to the youth it comes natural to us um that motherly that nurturing nature of us um and that's what makes good leadership that's what makes you pull you go up but you pull the person below you up as well and in the agriculture and specifically in wine agriculture that is exactly what we need in this moment in time Thank you and thank you all so much for participating. I'm sorry that we have run out of time. So I just want to say to the audience that all of those questions that we have just received um we will definitely make sure to respond either via social media or in another way to the questions that you've asked. Um thanks for joining us. I think one of the um most probably the most key issues that I picked up from today's discussion that that I hope we will get another opportunity to talk about is this um the need to develop a capacity for risk in women so um so that they are able to take those opportunities that are out there with both hands you know without having without being too cautious and um with that holding women back so also from my side thank you so much to um to the the Western Cape Department of Agriculture for approaching Farmers Weekly to partner to host this webinar webinar and to Mary James at the department to put the program together thanks for your efforts and everyone who joined us i hope that the discussion was interesting and useful to you that you learned something and to all the women listening um uh, yeah go out today and achieve something and and don't be afraid of risk risk it there's a good chance that you'll be successful thank you and goodbye